Hello, welcome to this lesson on the kinetic molecular theory. The question of the day, what is your ideal vacation? The kinetic molecular theory describes the motion of atoms and molecules. Motion is defined by the conditions of temperature, and we have spoken about this before, that hot particles move fast and cold particles move slow. Gases that follow the kinetic molecular theory, or KMT, are called ideal gases. They are called ideal gases because when it comes time to do the math, if these gases are following the rules of the kinetic molecular theory, um, then we are allowed to do algebra. If they are not following the rules, then we are forced to do calculus. And um, chemists are lazy. That we kind of have a bad reputation for being lazy. So um, the ideal situation is not having to do calculus and only having to do algebra. So that's why we call them ideal gases. Um, another thing is that ideal gases don't really actually exist. Um, and you'll see that as we move through what actually defines an ideal gas and what defines the kinetic molecular theory. Um, when the gases are behaving in an ideal manner, we have a very small difference in the mathematical answer between the algebra and the calculus, um, so much so that it's not that important. But when the gases are acting not ideal, there's a bigger discrepancy. So um, that is kind of where the concept of ideal gases come from. They're not really real, um, but when they act in the way that we like them to, the difference is not that significant. So the postulates of the kinetic molecular theory really just means like the rules that these particles have to follow. Gases contain particles that are in constant random straight line motion. So this was a senior prank at my high school. Not while I was a senior. <laughs> I did not partake in this. Um, they threw a big bucket of bouncy balls down like a really big staircase that we had. So if you think about bouncy balls falling down the stairs, they are going to hit the stair, bounce off the stair, hit the wall, bounce off somebody's backpack. They're kind of bouncing all over the place. They're not swirling around in space. Um, so it's not like a cartoon. When you see like a gust of wind in a cartoon and the wind kind of like loop-de-loops, that's not that's just cartoons. That doesn't actually happen in real life. I know that that's how we think of gas particles because we've seen these cartoon wind gusts, but truthfully, they are always moving in straight lines and they just bounce off the walls of their container or things that they bang into. Next, when particles collide with each other or with the walls of their container, they kind of like split the energy 50-50. They just transfer energy. Whoever has more energy gives their energy to the particle with less energy, and we call those elastic collisions. Really what this means is that there is no overall loss of energy. A particle individually can lose energy, but it's gained by the particle that it smacks into. So overall, the energy of the system is going to stay the same. It's just transferring within. Looking back to particle diagrams, we know that gas particles are really small, and there is a heck of a lot of space between them. Thinking about this, uh, we know that the volume of individual particles is ignorable or negligible. Really what this means is that whatever the volume of the container is, that is the volume of the gas because it spreads out and takes up the entire space. If we wanted to count the individual particles as the volume, we would have to compress the gas to the point where it was just, just a shred into the gas phase and just a shred out of the liquid phase. If you push these particles close enough together, they will become a liquid. Um, so we kind of just ignore all of that and we say, you know what, whatever the container is, that's the volume of the gas. So I have this mug. I really like the office. If I were to put a cap on this mug, the amount of air that is in here, like the volume of the, the air in here is the volume of the mug. I could take a giant like plunger or syringe and squish all of this air down until I couldn't squish it anymore. And that would be 
the volume of the gas if that's how we defined volume of a gas. We don't actually sit and compress. We just say the container is the volume of the gas because these gas particles like to spread out. Because the gas particles like to spread out, uh, we assume that they spread out far enough that they don't feel intermolecular forces between each other. So we assume that they don't attract and they don't repel. This is a poor assumption because in actuality, we know that gas particles will attract and repel each other. If they are attracted to each other, they will pull in and shrink their volume a tiny bit. And if they are repulsed or repel each other, they will push apart and expand their volume a little bit. Um, but we kind of say that it breaks even, like probably half the particles are going to be attracted to the neighbor and half the particles are going to be repelled by the neighbor. So we kind of just split it and say, let's pretend it's not happening. Um, but this is a fair thing for us to do because these particles are very far apart from each other. Next up is that the energy of the sample, the average kinetic energy, is directly proportional to the temperature of the sample, essentially meaning that the average kinetic energy is more or less the same as the temperature. The more kinetic energy a particle has, the more temperature or the higher the temperature and if it has a lower average kinetic energy, it will have a lower temperature. We spoke about this back when we did energy flow. So if you need a refresher on that, the link will be in the video description. It's also important to remember that standard temperature can be measured in either Kelvin or Celsius. Kelvin we like to use for calculations because there's no negative numbers, but a lot of our lab data comes in Celsius. So we have to sometimes convert between those two. 273 Kelvin is equal to zero degrees Celsius. Now, a gas that follows all five of those postulates would be called an ideal gas. Again, this is a hypothetical gas because we know that these assumptions aren't really true. We just kind of assume them so we can get away with not having to do a calculus. Um, so that hypothetical gas is going to follow the rules of the kinetic molecular theory. They are the most gas-like and they are going to follow PLIGHT, which is an acronym. The acronym PLIGHT stands for pressure, low, ideal gas, high temperature. Now it's time to visualize. If the pressure is low, that means we are not squeezing our particles together and they are going to have room to spread out. When they spread out, they are not going to feel intermolecular forces. Um, they're going to spread and take up the entire container. The same is true if they have a high temperature. If they have a high temperature, they're going to move faster and they're going to spread out. When these particles are spread out, they behave more like an ideal gas and we can better do algebra instead of calculus. So defining pressure, pressure is how hard gases are banging or how hard the gas particles are banging off the walls of their container or pushing on the walls of their container. We can also apply pressure to gases, which would be the, the force of like squeezing them. We measure pressure in a lot of different units. Most of our equations ask us to use atmospheres, which is ATM at sea level on earth. You would exist at a pressure of one atmosphere. Uh, if you go higher up into the atmosphere, you lose pressure. And if you go below sea level, uh, which some cities are below sea level, they are going to experience higher pressure than one atmosphere. We also have kilopascals. Kilopascals are a metric unit for measuring pressure. Um, one atmosphere is considered standard pressure and 101.3 kilopascals is considered standard pressure. So those two values are equal to each other. Then we have two more, which are more commonly used, I believe, in meteorology, so the study of weather. They don't come up super often in chemistry, but uh, we have millimeters of mercury, which literally measures how much mercury is in the tool in millimeters. Um, and then we have tor, which is effectively the same thing. For both millimeters of mercury and tor, standard pressure would be 760 of that particular unit. That is all I have for you on the kinetic molecular theory and ideal gases. 
I know it's a little abstract. It will kind of make a little bit more sense as we go and piece together all of this information. So please subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson. Leave any questions you have below in the comments section, and I will see you next time. Bye.